This is Leafs Morning Take with Nick Alberga and Jay Rosehill. Now we've got a fight started here right off the bat with Rosehill. 30 minutes of live, non-stop Leafs talk starts now. Presented by Botano and Skip, it's the Wednesday edition of Leafs Morning Take. The night, or the day, I should say, following a round two playoff game for the Toronto Maple Leafs. It's Nick Alberga and Jay Rosa with you. Rosie, how are you, buddy? Not bad. A little disappointed, but uh, just like everyone else, it is what it is. Game one's over, focusing on game deuce. Hey, we talked about it. It's classic overreaction day, similar to round one. Maybe not to the extent, but win, you're winning the Stanley Cup, lose, the season's over, right? It's just one game. It's just game one. Yeah, you would like to get it, but they're going to move on from this. Yeah, it seems like uh, it's not that big of an overreaction so far. I mean, people get yeah. it. It was, uh, I think their start kind of made people feel a little better. They came out with some jam and it was a pretty high octane uh, beginning to that game and uh, obviously didn't go their way, but it wasn't like the typical, oh my God, what is this team um, type of gong show that it was in the first round. So I think people are getting it, you know. Um, we ran into this team that's an absolute buzzsaw right now. If anyone thought that this was going to be an easy series or they're going to walk through the Florida Panthers, you're out of your mind. I mean, they literally just knocked off the Boston Bruins. So this team is buzzing. Uh, it's going to take a huge effort to beat them. And I think they showed that last night. And I think the boys are going to regroup. It's all about setting a tone, my dude. And I was just so fired up watching game one and how contagious being physical is. We could start with this at unsurprisingly our favorite guest on this program luke shen kicks things off he had a couple of big time hits on matthew kachuk last night break this down for us yeah they were absolutely throwing bodies catching them i mean it was uh it was nice to see the maple Leafs putting guys on their asses last night and um the physicality went both ways it was good to watch it wasn't cheap stuff it wasn't uh a bunch of chirping it wasn't a bunch of scrums it was just crashing bodies good playoff hockey so love to see the blue and white putting guys on their backs and uh you know you got to do more of that on that number 19 god damn it he was killing us last night yeah he was and we'll get to that story but how great was it to hear the the crowd chanting sammy's name uh luke for luke like it it had luke. that feel and we'll get to the crowd because they came out hot and they sort of deflated as the, as the game went on maybe too many vodka sodas like i did last last time i went to the game right yeah, it, it happens. I mean, you start hot and it was physical and it was fast and uh, yeah, you get yeah. down to rip. It'll take the window to your sails in a hurry. I would just say as well, remember to subscribe, tap that like button, leave us a review wherever you're checking us out at the Leafs Nation 401 here on YouTube. If you're watching and are not subscribed, please subscribe right now at the Leafs Nation 401 for all our great content, including our interview yesterday with Adam Edge Copeland of WWE. Additionally, we're available wherever you find your podcasts. And don't forget to visit theleafsnation.com for the very latest on all things Toronto Maple Leafs. Thoughts, comments, questions, or concerns. I'm looking at the chat right now on my phone. People are buzzing. A couple people are dejected. It's just game one, folks. Just relax. So send us your thoughts on how you see this series playing out, what you saw in game one, and what, like, what you're looking forward to seeing in game number two. But for now, let's get over the boards. All right, so this is the way I saw it, Rosie. Uh, it was a combination of minimal puck luck for the Leafs, especially in the first period. They were a bit, a bit snake-bitten. And Sergei Bobrovsky. Like, I'm not going to get to that level where this was like vintage Bobrovsky. I thought he made some big-time stops, namely on Austin Matthews. But he makes 34 saves. You combo that all together. We talked about this going into this series. Uh, a lot of local products on this Florida roster, including Carter Verhage, who I think ever since being drafted by the Leafs has just killed this team. So I wasn't shocked to see him snipe the winner. He had a 40-plus goal campaign, but that landed on a 4-2 win for the Panthers in Game 1. Yeah, it, uh, it was a little closer game than I think the um, the score would indicate, and I, I agree with it. I mean, the puck luck wasn't there. You know, we're, you know, Austin Matthews, the first you know shift of the game for him, I believe. He's on a breakaway wires, one that could just easily go in that elbow bar down and hits the knob of his stick. And then after that, it was a bit of a snake bitten feel. And I mean, I felt like they got a little bit too cute with the puck and they were passing yeah. up chances to just rifle it in the back of the net. They were looking for that extra, you know, back door, cross crease pass and, um, a little bit of that going on for sure. Like in the playoffs, you get chances when things are scrambling, you're wiring that thing off the net. 
let it bounce off skates, let it, the rebounds come out, crash the net. I think Dallas Aiken said it well in the in the post game. You know, there wasn't enough pucks to that blue paint, and there wasn't enough bodies there. And um, it, I don't think against this team that's absolutely a buzzsaw right now, you're going to get uh, these fancy, pretty, you know, tic-tac-toe type plays. It's not really playoff hockey. And I would have liked to see them fire a little bit more at the net and just bury their chances because it seemed like it was you were ready to stand up and cheer. And then they try to go, you know, sauce that thing back door. So a little bit of that going on. Bobrov- Bobrovsky stole the show. I am I mean, he was, uh, you know, when we thought we had a chance to, to tie it or to get back in it or take the lead. I mean, he's he's getting a piece of everything. So that's just the way it goes in the playoffs. They played well. Give them credit. They've got game one and, and we got to go out and get game two. Um, I want to touch a little bit on Nylander like man, did he ever seem to go the wrong direction in some in some instances. Like, it was like he was stoned or something on a couple of plays. Well, um, I, yeah. I, I noticed him. I, I saw that he was, uh, you know, creating chances. A couple of times, though, it's like this extra effort would get you the puck. Um, mm-hmm. Keeping to move your feet, you could roast a D-man. He just kind of glides in. It's like, what are you going to do against an NHL defenseman just kind of gliding when, you know, you're, you're not in an odd man rush? So, a little bit of that going on that one picture of him just going absolute south with the puck and there's a couple of pictures where there literally isn't a human being within the entire zone and he's going straight against the grain i don't know how we could explain that but a couple of head scratchers but again they got to regroup yeah. I, I won't lie social media kills me sometimes and again you played in the nhl so you know how quick this game is and i know that that picture is surfacing of of Nylander looking over his shoulder, sort of, and nobody's in the vicinity. But what people miss is the fenceman drop really, really quickly, and Nylander was already headed the opposite direction. Like, I'm giving this guy the benefit of the doubt. He's a world-class uh, player, uh, world-class playmaker and shooter. I think if he saw that opportunity, he would have taken it. But the play happened so quickly, right? And I think they were just a step behind last night. I had minimal issues with their game overall. I think, obviously, there's a couple of things they have to clean up puck-wise. A couple other things that stood out to me as well, Rosie, the power play. I thought they were snapping it around. Like it was very, you know, similar, I would say, to the game where they made maybe one too many passes and uh, the puck luck wasn't there. A couple went right by the post. And the other thing that's been killing this team in the Stanley Cup playoffs is the late goals in the period with less than two minutes remaining. That's now six. They lead the entire NHL in that. So if they can clean, there's only a couple things to clean up, man. Like I think. Honestly, I came out of that game feeling pretty damn good about this team. Uh, I liked the first period, too. They did not look tentative. They didn't look nervous. In fact, I think it was quite the opposite, where I think they lacked a bit of intensity. It had that beer league feel. But all in all, it seems like the pressure has been lifted from this team. That's why I genuinely feel optimistic about this series. Yeah, that's good to hear out of you. You've been, uh, you know, you have been hurt and broken and you've seen it all from this team like a lot of fans have and you have reasons to doubt certain things. But now that they've got over that hump, I think collectively for everyone, the team and the and the fans, you can kind of say, all right, that's done. We've been focused on that for so goddamn long. It's become this massive thing. Now, finally, it's broken. It falls apart. It's not there anymore. Move on. And it's it's definitely like a weight's gone. I love the way they started the game as, as well as you yeah. did. Uh, thought those first two power plays, I mean, you get gifted a couple back-to-back power plays, and they were peppering them with chances. I mean, that could easily have been 2 nothing, and, and it wasn't. And, you know, we've had games in the, in the previous series with Tampa where – we got out chanced and we pulled off the game. So it goes both ways, that puck luck. But um, I think you need to tighten up defensively a little bit. I think that the D-men get spread apart a little bit and you you kind of give up the, the middle of the ice. And I mean, first thing they tell you in pro is those dots are your friend. You play dots in, keep everything to the outside. You're not going to beat anybody in the NHL from the outside of those dots. And we got spread out and crazy. I mean, that TJ Brody play, I just can't believe he yeah. didn't notice that his partner was way up at the goal line and it's just a simple stay in the middle, keep it to the outside. You know, your third man high might catch up and it's not a huge deal. And he just, I don't even know what he did. He's like, he could touch the, he could touch the bench from where he was and lets the guy go right. It was just, Oh, it was such a killer. So you you tighten up that kind of stuff. The D men play a little bit tighter. Don't run around in your zone so much. If you can help it, Lay the body on that 19. I mean, have a have an understanding and an awareness of when he's out there and try to take away that time and space. But uh, again, a couple minor adjustments there and a uh, little bit of puck luck. 
you can't expect Bobber to stand on his head like that every single game, or he will steer the, steal a series. But, uh, you know, it could be a very different game on Thursday. And, again, there's reason that not everyone is thinking the sky's falling right now. The big thing I would bring up is puck management. And you know this better than most people having played the game at the professional level, played in the NHL. And this is dating back to the Tampa series, and we saw it at bits and pieces throughout this season. The turnovers, the pizzas, the mistakes, like especially this time here, I thought costly turnovers cost them, you know, cost them big time, clearly. Uh, it seemed like every time they made a mistake, it was uh, you know the Panthers or the Lightning the other way, and they would score the goal, right? And you talk about Brody, you talk about that, that Aaron. And more times than not, like patience is a virtue in this league, and that's what I really, really picked up on again yesterday, is early on, later on in the game, just the giveaways, the free passes. They just have to be a bit more crisper. Like the level of urgency has to be rampant up, in my opinion. And I think if they do that, I think they're going to be a good standing, Rosie. Yeah, and and yeah, you, you touched on it in the last couple, like the last minute of a game. I mean, when you're on the bench in those leagues, the coaches are yelling out, you know, last minute here, last minute here, got to yeah. be smart. That means the D-men aren't pinching. That means you're not throwing the puck through the middle of the ice. That means you're you're erring on the side of caution. You it's just deflating as hell. I mean, we would have gone into that period, into that intermission with so much uh, momentum, and it's just a killer to get scored on the last minute of, of the period. And they have done it consistently. So obviously they're not paying attention to the clock. They're not managing the game. I mean, everyone should be yelling out, you know, last minute, last minute. Whoever you put on the ice out there has to be one of your most responsible guys out there, especially when you've scored a goal and you own the momentum. That's especially when you got to tighten up, keep the middle safe, Keep it dots out and uh, and keep the puck out of your net in the last minute. It is such a killer. I mean, there's nothing better than burying that unexpected goal with a minute left and the whole bench is just like, didn't expect that. And you go into the dressing room and everyone's everyone's kind of, all right, we're, we're rocking and rolling here. It's a big positive environment and you carry that into that next period. It's it's a killer and they've been doing it a lot. So that's something they could absolutely tighten up. Um, You know, on the, on the adverse of that, I thought Luke Shen, like his patience oh, with the so puck. Good. Yeah, down low, like I mean, I I know Luke well. I played with him, and I I think he's as good as ever. Every time he's like, oh shit, he's got the puck in a bad spot, mm -hmm. maybe handcuffed, maybe got someone else's problem. Guys on him, he just kind of goes through their triangle, looks like, and then snaps a hard one, or he just holds onto it for a second. The guy swoops, and then he goes behind the net to his his partner, and it's pure patience, which is uh, really nice to see. I noticed that for sure. If he can continue that, you know, if he can pass that on to uh, TJ Brody a little bit, and mm -hmm. if everyone can just kind of, you know, have some confidence, have some poise with that puck, make the right plays, support the puck. Where if a guy does get in a jam, he's always got an outlet. Those little things are what really makes a difference, especially in the playoffs. So again, small adjustments they need to make and get a little bit of puck luck. Get uh, there's no reason to be panicking. Uh, it was a hell of a lot worse in uh, in game one, and we pulled that series out. So. I thought it was a great tweet last week, uh, I believe after game six, where it was like Luke Shen played like a fifth overall pick. But I think it's entirely right. Like this guy deserves way more credit than he's getting right now. He brought up Quinn Hughes earlier in the year, and now he's bringing up Morgan Rally. Morgan Rally, I thought, was really, really good again. And again, this type of hockey is contagious, and I could not agree with you more. I think in terms of patience, the way he played with the puck, it seemed like every time it went into the boards near Shenner, made the right decision, made the right play, getting the puck out of the zone. Like, that's all you can ask for from that type of defenseman. And I've been really, really impressed. And we're not just saying that because he's our boy and he's been on our show a couple times. Like, he is playing really, really well. And again, when other players on that roster see that, I think it's, like, infectious. And then they start to play the physical game. Like, we talked about the physicality. Where do you think that started? It started from Luke Shen in game one of that series against Tampa. All of a sudden, you got everybody completing hits. Like, I saw Kerfoot hitting. I saw Marner hitting. I saw Nyes hitting. Jake McCabe had a couple rips yesterday. They're finally playing that style that is conducive to winning in the Stanley Cup playoffs, in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I said at the beginning of the show, it's nice to see the blue and white putting guys on their ass. Usually yeah. they're the ones kind of trying to dangle everyone and they want to play street hockey and they're shying away from the hits and they're turning away from the scrums and they're the ones getting put on their ass. And it's just, uh, it's not that way this year. And I mean, we talked about adding, you know, Achari and, and O'Reilly and Luke Shen and these guys that uh, that can get in there and have that presence is is bloody huge. And I think it's a big reason why they're in the second round right now. Uh, you touched on Matthew Nye's getting his first goal what as a, a Leafs first goal in the playoffs oh. first goal in the NHL I mean he's a big time player man and I uh I just I just 
thought this kid was going to make a difference on this roster. I thought it's what they needed. Um, and I thought he had, uh, you know, a big enough, um, you know, what do you call it? Pedigree to step yeah. into this league, whether it be the playoffs or not and make a difference. And there's not a chance in hell that they've even thought about bringing this guy to the lineup since he first stepped in it. So uh, good on him for getting that first one. And hopefully it opens the doors for him to get uh, many more and, you know, a, a nice offensive breakout where everyone's rolling would be so nice in game two, you know, Tavares, Nylander, Matthews, Marner, everyone's just on fire and you can just destroy a team. We've yet to see that. I feel this year where everyone's kind of clicking on all cylinders. Yeah. They take their turns with it, which is nice to ham and egg it and kind of have guys to pick up the slack. But if everyone could catch fire in the playoffs here, I mean, I don't think they could be beat, but we've yet to see it. The most impressive part about Matthew Nyes is how he learns on the fly and he learns from his mistakes. Like we've seen it probably three or four times already in his short time. He's been in the NHL for 22 days, three weeks, man. Just think about that and think of what he's accomplished already. Not to mention how much he went through in the college ranks throughout the season, being a Hobie Baker finalist and just producing and producing and producing. And that's what impressed me the most about game one. So he probably makes that assignment mistake that leads to the two, one goal comes back. What? 11 seconds later, with his first NHL tuck. Like, this guy does yeah. not have a pulse, man. Like, he is playing like a seasoned pro. And how many times of the seven games we've seen this team play in the Stanley Cup playoffs have we been in agreement that Matthew Nyes was one of the better players? You sort of forget he's 20, right? Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, good on Keith for, for keeping him out there. It's, uh, you know, it's it's so often that a guy makes a, a mistake and he just disgustingly changes the line. Doesn't matter how long they've been out there and just yeah. get him off, get him off, get him off. And, and you go sit down and co coach comes talks in your ear. The assistant coach says, Hey, we, you know what you did there. <laughs> and you know, yeah, I fucking know. And it's, it's the same old story. And then you go out there and then you're a little bit tighter and whatnot, especially for a young guy, you know, who's kind of teetering on what am I in this league? You keep him out there and that's how he responds. And I think he's earned that ability to, to stay out there after a mistake and, to have that uh, that confidence and the trust in the head coach to to leave a young guy out there and obviously he just responds instantly, which is such a good sign of this kid's confidence and and ability to take control out there. And like you say, he's learning every shift and he's he's getting better every shift. So good on him. He's huge to have on the roster. And again, it would just be nice to find everyone clicking on all cylinders, tighten up a few defensive things, and and away we go with this series. We got to find a way to tame this this hot team. Yeah, I would say credit to Michael Bunting for scoring his first of the postseason. But on the Nyes note, I wonder how Bunting feels watching Nyes produce on that top line saying, hey, there is my roster spot and there is the potential of me staying in Toronto because I've been overtaken by a 20 year old. But so be it. He's looked really, really good on that top line. And I thought it was only fitting that Nyes scores his first NHL goal and who gets the assist, a uh, local product that AZ obviously in, in Austin Matthews. So Rosie, imagine being in excess of or paying in excess of 500 bucks plus to stay and be in that arena for game one, the first playoff series, per, first second round series in 19 years. And then you sit on your hands for half the night. And there's a couple people on Twitter last night that suggested we talk about this on the show. We had bits and pieces throughout the season where we talked about the crowd, lack thereof in Toronto. You played in this building. I thought they were rocking and rolling in like the first period and a half. And, the game was close. It had that playoff feel. And I don't know what transpired. Maybe you can speak to it a bit more. But like the third period, dude, it was dead. And it was like a coin flip game at that point in time where it was going back and forth. And maybe the Verhage goal was, um, you know, a bit teetering and a bit flattening for the crowd. But I, I was really, really disappointed. I won't lie. This city has been waiting so long. And this is not an indictment on the fans. I think the real fans are outside. Yeah, I think so. And a few things. I mean, that building, some of those new buildings, not that it's a new building, but some of those, it's not. they're all purpose venues. It wasn't built for the Toronto Maple Leafs hockey game. It wasn't even, they weren't even going to be in that building till after fact. They had to, they had to like retrofit the, the locker room into that building. And, uh, you know, they're made for concerts. They're made for all purpose venues and they don't get as rocking as the old barns do. That being said, I have had that building absolutely buzzing before so it is 100 possible i remember ponikarovsky looking over at me and s i don't know what the hell the scenario was but it was so loud in there you could feel like the pressure of the decibels and pony looked over and said yeah. i've never heard this building that loud and he'd played there a long time so it is possible but when you get down to nothing in the first period the wind gets taken out of your sails and when you never regain the lead in a game it's tough to uh you know get real loud and excited about everything 
albeit at the end of the game when you're peppering and you're trying to get back in the game is when it would be nice to have an absolute you know monster crowd just blowing the doors off the place um and i think they were headed there you can see that goal leaves go chant and everything kind of building and then they scored again to make it a two goal game so i mean i'm not gonna i'm not gonna hate on it it's uh they were jacked at the beginning of the of the game it, the game didn't go the way they wanted to to get that place rocking but um you know, and that being said, we know what the Toronto clientele is when you do pay $500 a game. The people who paint their faces and take their shirts off and scream their, their self hoarse aren't the type of people who have an extra 600 bucks laying around just to go to a two-hour hockey game. Let's be honest. It's the business crowd and everything else. So it is what it is, but I think if the game was different and the score was different and, and it played out different, that place would be a hell of a lot louder. It's been really bizarre. You know, seven games, I think they've won one of four home games and the rest on the road. And maybe it's just the road Stanley Cup playoffs. Like, we're going to talk about momentarily, but, like, the road teams have been finding a lot of success. I'm just disappointed, man. Like, it's been such a long time to get to this scenario, and then they just can't show up, them being the crowd. Um, but I do think home ice, to an extent, is a tad overrated. Um, you talked about it sort of being a player on the ice, how that feels. The NBA is maybe a bit different where home court advantage is pretty much everything. And there's a couple barns in the NHL, namely Carolina, where it's like, you know, you're going into that building. It's going to be a tough night. But I just was generally disappointed because of how long it's taken to get here. I don't care who's in that barn. You paid lots of money. Just make some noise. Like, get behind the players, right? And it's just the same old story in this market, unfortunately. Yeah, it is what it is. There's different barns that are that are that way. And I mean, there are a few different things with Toronto. I mean, you go there, most most opposing players are excited to be there because of how many, yeah. you know, just what the population is and how many people are from there. And they're excited to play. It's, it's fun to go to Toronto. Um, and then, you know, when you go on the road, I think with the Toronto Maple Leafs, you know, a bit of that pressure and spotlight might be off a little bit. And you can kind of flourish in that way sometimes. And uh it's um i can't remember my third point but uh it, oh yeah if you, if you have a coach that tends to overthink the matchups and the lineups and stuff if you take that out of their hands and get them on the road then it's just kind of hey we're just rolling them and and they can match against us and and then you have a different mentality about it where when you're on the road when you're at home and you've got the last change you can start to overthink it and, and mess up the lines and mess up the rhythm and oh this guy's out again that was unexpected and oh we got we haven't put so and so out there for a long time we got to get him out here and it, you, you're jumbling around too much sometimes i'm not saying keeps doing that but there's a tendency to do that too and I mean, you touched on the, the home ice advantage not being a huge deal to this organization right now. And it's kind of proven to be uh, to come out true. It is what it is. We move on here on the show brought to you by our new friends over at Skip. We're happy to tell you about Mitch's Dishes by Skip using the promo code TLN15. That's TLN15 on the Skip the Dishes app. You'll get $15 off when you spend $30 or more on Mitch's Dishes. Please note that this offer is exclusive to Skip. Additionally, a portion of the proceeds will be donated to the Marner Assist Fund to combat food insecurity. Skip is currently serving up game time eats across the GTA and Ontario in the likes of Brampton, Guelph, Kitchener, Toronto, Oshawa, and Waterloo, among other places. If Mitch likes it. It's got to be great. Did somebody say Skip? Which leads us to the Botano wrap-up. It's presented by Botano.ca. The game starts now 19+. plus. Please play responsibly. I won't lie, Rosie, as a better last night, I was just hoping for somebody to score when it was 4-2. They got the peeper. O'Reilly was bleeding. I get it. I just couldn't sell Bobrovsky, and Florida couldn't score that empty netter. I had the over 6.5, so I actually lost. But I know you're coming off shift, so I'm bouncing back today. Here is my bet, Rosie. Everything I just mentioned about the roadsides and all the success they've been having, I'm going to take a little peek at the New Jersey Devils fresh off their Game 7 victory against the New York Rangers. It's the rest versus rust conversation for me. The Canes have been off since Friday. I know they're excellent on home ice. I know that whole story, but the Devils, man, there's just something about that team. So I like New Jersey in game one. Uh, you see on your screen some plus money here. Yeah, why not plus money? I like it. Um, it's kind of a toss up uh, to start a series. You don't really know what the vibe of it's yeah. going to be until you see it. And I mean, what's with the Devils being knocked? They might have a reason to have a chip on their shoulder everyone was talking about the New York Rangers and I mean Shesterkin and it was just I mean I guess the additions they made at trade deadline made them more flashy and and something to talk about but did the New Jersey Devils not have a better record than them all year long did they not finish higher than them like what are like no one talked about them no one gave them a chance regardless so um 
I think they could have a reason to be an underdog chip on their shoulder and come out hot for sure. So not a bad bet in my opinion. Yeah, no, sorry to cut you off. You're right. Yeah, they had the better record and it just sort of came out of nowhere. And I think you look at the roster of the Rangers, you look at the Devils and you say like, these aren't established pros. But again, it's a young man's game. We know that Akira Schmid was a great story. Out dueled Igor Shishorkin. It's funny for all the uh, publicity the Rangers made at the trade deadline, getting Tarasenko, getting Patrick Kane, it falls flat right in their faces and full credit to the New Jersey Devils. So I'm on the Devils on the road here. I know it's a couple days off for that team. I know Carolina's had a couple more days than them, but I like, I'm going to stay consistent with that road theme and take a look at the uh, New Jersey Devils on the road. By the way, before we get to the chat, how about Mitch Marner being nominated for the Selkie Trophy, a.k.a. the Patrice Bergeron Award? Bergeron's won five times. He's going to win this year for for my money. Nico Heischer's in that conversation. But well done, Mitch Marner, man. Like this is a these are high honors. I mean, you look at the the statistics on the bird first and on the board first and foremost. Like that's really really damn impressive to be nominated amongst you know some great players, obviously, in Heischer and Bergeron. Seriously, I uh, I had to kind of double take it and 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 see if that was real. Um, solid defensive guy does the penalty killing thing and everything, but for a hundred point guy, you would think, uh, you know, he's more offensive minded, obviously than to be so defensively minded that you're up for the Selkie. So good on him. It shows, uh, you know, it's a bit of a feather in the cap for a guy that says, can say, Hey, I, I play two way hockey too. And certainly don't think he's going to win, but, uh, just nice to be nominated. Good for him. I mean, that's an asset having a guy that can put up a hundred points and, uh, and still take care of his own end and, and be relied on in that sense. So good for him. Put it this way, man. Just think how far Mitch Marner has come, right? From where he was, Mr. Offensive minded, really, really struggled. Couldn't put him in all situations in the game. He's now killing penalties, the stick lifts, the defensive yeah. play. I don't think he'll ever get those honors, and maybe he did now with this Selkie nomination, but that's a big step forward in his career. Like I think people don't forget because of everything that's happened in this market the last couple of years, the importance of Mitch Marner, how great of a player he truly is, and most importantly, all around how good he is, right? The guy gets 90, 99 points, 100 points a season, sniffing around every year, but I like the fact that he's now being recognized for what he does uh, you know, without the puck. Yeah, and I'm uh, I'm one of those people. I, I kind of look at him as uh, Mr. Turnover once in a while when he when he wants to you know dangle and be flashy and turning the puck over as the last man back. Like it, it, it's true, he's not doing that anymore, and and he has cleaned that up. He has matured and he has grown as a player. And uh, you know, shame on me for not noticing it more. But uh, good for him. It's it's a hell of a accolade to have and and an asset to have on your team and your roster someone that can do as much as he can offensively this which is kind of all I really think about him as besides you know he can kill penalties and whatnot but obviously to get that uh to get that nomination is is a big deal as far as um being aware of of his ability defensively so good for him well done Mitch we need a goal big time in game two of this series coming up on Thursday night to the chat we go Patrick G Mafia no urgency and too complacent the Leafs' heads were still in the Tampa series while Bobrovsky came to play. I sort of disagree with that. I thought Toronto was actually pretty good in the game. It's just funny how it works out. I, I didn't think they were great. I didn't think they were fantastic in the first round. They found a way. This is probably one of their better games, but sometimes puck luck uh, plays a part. Uh, some timely saves. You're not wrong on that aspect when it comes to Bobrovsky, but uh, it is what it is. You're going to lose some of those. You're going to win some of those. They didn't get the bounces, and uh, that's fine. Sharp like attack, game one feeling out the Panthers, go Leafs go. I tend to agree with that as well. Uh, K Rizzi after the first 10 minutes, Leafs settled in. Uh, no time to panic. Uh, super strict nine, 0 for 4 on the PP is unacceptable. I thought the power play was yeah. snapping it around, man. Like you're just going to have those nights where you're just a smidget off. And again, to your credit and to your point, the Panthers came to play. I mean, they're not going to roll over. They won the President's Trophy last year and they're feeling pretty damn good about life coming off. Uh, a series victory in game seven where they sort of stole game seven late, you know, tie it, then win it in OT. But they beat the best regular season team in history, right? They they own the wins record. Like, they, they did something pretty damn amazing. Yeah, yeah they're, they're certainly not going to be easy. I think they've proven that. I don't believe anyone in that room thought they were going to be easy. I liked the way yeah. they came out. And, yeah, the puck luck, not, I mean – 
Yeah, you can. Usually when they're bad and when they have no urgency, they get lit up by their fan base for it and say, what the yeah. hell was that? Are you kidding me? That's how you come out. They have no heartbeat. Fire Dubis, fire Key, fire fucking, and they go nuts. So don't act mm-hmm. like when something doesn't go their way and you say, hey, there wasn't much we can do about that. There wasn't much puck luck. And everyone go, mm-hmm. oh, you Leafs fans, blah, 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 blah. It is what it is. It's the truth. I mean, if you put together a highlight reel of them hitting the knob of his stick, him robbing them on an open chance, um, you know, Tavares took that clapper far side wide open. He labels that every time and yep. absolutely whiffs on one somehow. That's uncharacteristic of him. Uh, Willie Nylander got, had some times where he got snake bitten, and it's just, uh, you know, that power play, I was just like out of my chair four times in two mm-hmm. minutes. And you just can't believe, oh, shit, they didn't get one on that peeper. It looked like they would have three or four times. And that's just the way it goes sometimes. So I think it's 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 right and it's correct to chalk it up as that and to move on. And I think if they play the same way, they could get a, a win out of the deal. And hopefully they, they step it up and play better. And, you know, game two is a different story. I've never been moral victory guy, and I'm certainly not going to be in this scenario, but I didn't leave that game wondering what the fuck happened. And, and I'll, I'll say that's a, a pro, a massive pro. Like, they showed up. They played well. They had a good start. They checked a lot of boxes in that game. They played well enough to win that hockey game. So we'll leave it at that. We look forward to the show, Rosie, coming up tomorrow to preview game two of this series. And we'll also get into the conversation about the series schedule that finally was released. I can't believe the days off between – two and three and three and four. We're going to have like two games in a week, but so be it. I think a lot of time for us to break down what you've seen so far in this series. So we'll talk tomorrow. Okay, bud. All right. Sounds good. We will see you tomorrow to continue the conversation. Fired up. That is Jay Rosehill. Many thanks to producer Alex and thanks to everybody in the chat. Remember to subscribe at the Leafs Nation 401. Hammer that like button. I'm Nick Alberga. Thanks so much for listening and watching. Take care.